So once we've got to the exchange of rights, okay, so we have this, this type of human being that has a certain type of rights or a certain set of inalienable rights, and they delegate them to a certain type of governance, in this case, the state. What type of human being is this for review? It's somebody who is sovereign, right? Someone who is individual, someone who is a self-owning agent, right? Mm -hmm. That gives us the, the right of free speech and the right of, uh, of belief. Um, someone who's suspicious of others, okay? That's also uh, a holdover from Hobbes. And the category of human is both homogenous in the sense that all human beings, at least the abstract human being, is theoretically similar to everybody else, right? So we have legal um, singularity as opposed to legal pluralism, right? We're going to have one law that's going to apply to everybody as opposed to multiple laws that are going to apply to different communities, depending on their faith or whatever. And it's so it's homogenous, but it's also exclusive. And mm -hmm. that means that uh, no animals, no environment, no mm -hmm. trees, no sun, right? We're just talking about these are the only uh, eligible creatures for rights. And even to call it creatures is my doing, not their doing, right? Like, uh, like they're the only eligible entities that could possibly have rights or at least natural rights. Um, so when we get to delegating to the state specifically, this responsibility of safeguarding our sovereignty or safeguarding these natural rights, this is a move that is extremely, extremely significant for us. And as said, uh, talks a lot about it because the language of human rights today is globalist and international in scope, right? You find the liberals and maybe the Labour Party, I don't know, uh, in, in the UK, they're interested in Amnesty International and they're concerned about what's going on in China and they're concerned about certain things at a global sphere. They're not yeah. Um, nativists or they're not the, the united nations which has formed obviously just after the second world war yes. uh you know so it's, uh, what was defined very much i think in terms of western conceptions of rights and morality yes. rather than say a chinese understanding or a muslim understanding or or any other kind of christian understanding so uh the united nations which is obviously based where in new york which happens to be um, right. uh, the world superpower um you know and that's no accident i think that the headquarters is based there as well Yes, of course. And ironically, you know, just as a, as a side point, you know, much more of the world supports an economic uh, declaration of human rights. And I re recall the United States vetoing it at several points, um, because obviously it would have certain uh, implications for how the United States should be should be set up. Um, but that's sort of a tangential point. The, mm. the important point that Essa wants us to realize is that who did we give our rights over to? Or who did we empower or delegate, theoretically, in order to pr protect these rights? It's the state. It's not the UN. It's not any international body. And mm -hmm. so human rights are always dependent upon national rights, civil rights. Mm -hmm. And if you ever find a conflict between the two, the civil rights are going to win every single time. Mm -hmm. And we see this play out. So he talks about, for example, Malcolm X uh, versus MLK. And we'll talk about MLK Jr. in a second. But Malcolm X attempted to um, provide or to construct a platform based off of human rights. And the logic was appealing. He said, okay, we're, we're, we're black people. Uh, we're in the United States. If we're only considering civil rights, then we're always going to be a minority. And we're always going to have to appeal to the majority's goodwill in mm. order to do us right. However, if we blow up the scale a little bit and we look at a zoom out and we look at the whole world, we're actually a majority. Like we have Africa behind us. We have Asia behind us. We have the colonized world behind us. And actually the people who aren't giving us our due rights or who, the people who are oppressing us or treating us unfairly, they are a very, very, very small minority. So the logic was, if we're able to zoom it out and appeal to human rights, then we're more likely to get our rights uh, than going through the kind of civil rights. However, the miscalculation was that civil rights always take priority and the state, the nation state, is the one who holds the keys in order to apply, identify violations of human rights and enforce them on whoever they want. And that's why the platform of Malcolm X was not successful, ultimately, uh, or one of the main reasons, because it neglected this aspect of state power, uh, which is imminent in a way that international bodies don't really have any teeth. And that's well known. Um, even if you, as it actually goes through a little bit of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and after kind of you know, um, it very quickly goes and recognizes that it depends upon the state to enforce these rights. That And so that has set up a situation where the states apply and don't apply according to their interests, right? They'll, they'll apply human rights when it's in the interest of them, uh, and they will disregard them whenever it uh, sees fit 
And we see that again with Guantanamo Bay and with the black sites and with all these sorts of things. Um, when it's somebody that the United States wants to criticize or justify a regime change or justify an invasion or justify violence, redemptive violence, supposedly, then it's about human rights. However, has anybody been successfully able to hold the United States accountable for human rights violations, take them to an international court of law, you know, freeze the assets of George Bush and Tony Blair and these folks and, yeah. you know, um, make them pay for anything that they've done? Of course not. Of but, course there's, not. But, there, but there's a reason for that. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The United States yes. has always refused to sign up to uh, the, these tre these international treaties uh, that hold yes. nations to account in human rights yes. because of the sense of American exceptionalism and the idea... Yes. We, we can't have these uh, international bodies or other entities holding America to it, Cam, because it's exceptional. It's the it's the great nation on Earth. So America actually refused to be held to account for the International mm -hmm. Criminal Court, for example. It is yes. actually not a signatory. It will not be held to account. But it expects other nations to be held to account yes. uh, for precisely the same jurisdiction. So the irony yes. is, you know, do, do as we say, not as we do, I yes. think might be the motto of... The State Department. <laughs> of course, no. There's the, the there's the surface level of hypocrisy that the United States always plays, but there's the deeper level of why does the ICC have to ask permission in the first place? If the ICC truly had sovereignty, it would not ask permission. It would simply impose the law, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's to show us the ground, and it starts again back with Hobbes, where we're we're consigning or delegating our rights or the preservation of our rights to the state, to a nation state particularly, not any sort of other sort of. Uh, body. And this comes up in a lot of different sort of other scenarios, some that we can think of, some that the Esad points to, the whole thing with the WikiLeaks and you have uh, Snowden and uh, Assange, um, right? You have, yeah, he's going to get extradited. Why? What takes priority? Mm -hmm. Like in this, this situation, we have human rights going against state rights and state rights is always going to win because yeah. Human rights and human rights institutions depend upon the nation state as a uh, as as an institution as a uh, a body in order to uh, to apply and inflict and and, 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 and Assange is is, is is crime is to expose war crimes uh, committed yeah. by the United States in killing civilians and because he did that he's now been hunted down uh, successfully it was seen by America the CIA apparently came out in the news recently were considering assassinating him. Uh, as as well as just uh, t taking him out, and and so he's on a, he's in a, in a London prison at the moment, uh, um, being extra. It's a terrible. You see the, the way that other people treat free speech is very important. We must defend the right to speak truth to power, except when it goes against our geopolitical interests. Um, yes. In that case, they are incarcerated or even taken yes. out. So, yes, yeah. fantastic, and that's a lovely segue. Just one one more situation, just for the, the listeners, and then that's a lovely segue to uh, who holds the keys and and why that's significant. Yeah. So uh, Esed brings up this situation where uh, the Greek nation, you know, Greece was trying to get admittance into the EU, and they had on their identity cards their religion. Religion was stated on their identity cards, their national identity cards, and this is something that was contradicting EU legislation or EU law. Like you had, to, you you were not allowed in order to gain admittance into the EU, you were not allowed to identify uh, your religion on an ID card, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an assumption behind that. The assumption behind that is that it's done for, you know, um, well, it's a legal sort of, uh, it, it, there's an assumption against legal plurality that you have to have one law for everybody. And there's an assumption that if you distinguish yourself as uh, somebody who's from a different religion, that you're going to become a second-class citizen, you're going to be treated with discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. However, you had people in Greece that wanted it to stay, and they were trying to complain, you know, that the EU was trying to force them to uh, to let go of their religious rights or their, their, their freedom of belief, their freedom to express their own religious belief. And the irony is, the irony is, the Greek state then stepped in because the Greek, Greek state wanted to be part of the EU. They wanted to... They decided unilaterally to remove uh, the category of religion from Greek identification cards, but the justification that they had for doing it is what's really telling. They they justified it by saying that this is not a threat to the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, right? So they did it with a religious justification. The state is the one that gets to decide what is threatening and what is not threatening to the Orthodox Church, not the Orthodox Church. So. All these sort of situations, this is all shining the light on who holds the keys, who gets to decide, who gets to decide who is fully human and who's not fully human, who has the power to identify what is fully good and what is fully evil, who is given the power to identify the obstacles that stand in the way of being fully human.
right? And thus create the imperative to remove them uh, and to restore the fully humanness. It is the secular state. Mm -hmm. So the secular state is the one that gets to decide who is fully human and who is not, and who is the legitimate uh, object of violence and who is the legitimate subject of, of redemption and to the night, the, to the end of it. Um, okay. Let's see here.